Okay, hello everyone. We are now at seven o'clock, so I'm excited to get this show on the road. So good evening, everyone. My name is Shauna. I am North Carolina Wildlife Federation's community organizer, and thank you to everyone for tuning in to tonight's webinar on the ever-flowing Eno and its wild inhabitants. I don't know about everyone here, but I'm super, super excited about tonight's topic, and I cannot wait to hear all about it. We are being joined by Eno River Association's Education Manager, Audrey Vaughn, an expert on all things Eno River. Audrey began her work with the association two years ago as an AmeriCorps member. Originally from Atlanta, she received her master's in wildlife conservation biology from NC State, go pack, and is extremely passionate about protecting native wildlife with a special interest in snake conservation. Much of her personal time is spent out on the banks of Eno, where she hikes and swims with her fiance and her dogs. We're super, super excited to have you here, Audrey. And before I give you the floor, I just wanted to go over a few housekeeping rules before we start tonight's webinar. Um, so before we dive in, I just wanted to let everyone know you are encouraged to type comments and questions in the chat throughout the presentation. And I'm going to drop a little note in the chat just so that everyone can see where it is. Um, okay, and... Um, there will be time at the end of the presentation for questions, so feel free to drop them in there as they pop into your mind, or if you would like to ask them personally, you can wait till the end, and you can ask it by going to the oh sorry, you can do it by going to the raise hand option at the bottom of your screen and then I can unmute you and we can ask your questions. And the last, so this presentation is being recorded. So if you would like to share this with your friends, uh, we'll be sending out an email with the link to the recording. And if you enjoyed tonight's presentation, make sure you tune in tomorrow night for another presentation on backyard nature. So without further ado, I'm going to hand the floor over to Audrey. Yay. Thank you, Shauna. Um, hi, everybody. I'm really happy. Can can you hear me okay, Shauna? Can you give me a thumbs up? You sound oh. good. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, I am really excited to be here tonight. Um, as Shauna said, my name is Audrey Vaughn, and I am the education manager for the Eno River Association. Uh, I'm just going to go to the next slide here to uh, show my email address if anybody is interested at the end and wants to reach out or anything. Um, and I can always also provide my email address in the chat. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I've been at the Eden River Association for about two years now. I actually started out as an AmeriCorps member um, and was able to stay on full time through a grant that we were able to get. So um, as of August, I'm a, um, an official Eno River Association staff member, which is exciting. Um, and then as Shauna mentioned, I'm originally from Midtown Atlanta uh, and moved to Raleigh about four years ago to go to grad school, ended up in Durham and um, about two years ago and really just fell in love with the Eno. Um, I had heard about it. I'd been been over to the Eno while I was in Raleigh and heard a lot about it. But, um, but when I moved to the Durham area and got the position at Eno River Association, it was just really a way to connect with the community around me. Um, the natural spaces around me and to like feel at home in Durham um, since I'm not from the area. Uh, so really, really passionate about it. And um, as you might have noticed, I'm also, I got my undergrad degree and my master's in wildlife conservation biology. So um, I really just love talking all things wildlife. Um, so really excited for this presentation tonight. So I'm going to be talking just a little bit about the Eno itself, <clears throat> some of the history, like some of the land use, uh, just a brief overview at the beginning, talk a little bit about the work of the Eno River Association, 
and then I will go into wildlife related things. I'm going to talk about some of the common species, like if you're out on the Eno, what are you likely to see? Of course, it depends on the time of year, but just some of the more common species. Then I'll talk about uh, some of the less common species, but um, ones that are definitely more um, abundant than we realize. And then um, I'll also, I'll kind of end with talking about a few of our like rare, threatened, endangered species that the river um, supports and the forest around the river support. So I will go ahead and jump into it. Um, so if you're not familiar, I'm not sure where everybody's from, um, but if you're not familiar with the Eno, um, I'm just going to do an overview of the river itself. So um, the river is about 40 miles long. It starts in Hillsborough at the Confluence Natural Area. That's this purple, purple area right here. Um, so it starts up there at the Confluence, and then it, it flows kind of uh, east down and eastward through the city of Durham. Um, and then eventually it empties out into Falls Lake. So it meets up with the Little River and the Platte River and it empties into Falls Lake. Um, <clears throat> the red boundary line that you see here is just the uh, Eno River watershed boundary. So all of the water that falls within this area kind of drains ultimately into the Eno River. Um, and then the dark green that you see is the state park, um, Eno River State Park. We'll talk a little bit more about the state park and like how it was formed, how it's grown over the years. Um, and then you also notice some of the kind of uh, natural preserves and city parks like West Point on the Eno City Park um, scattered throughout. This is not, um, this map needs to be updated a little bit um, to include things like Panther Branch, which is our um, newest nature preserve, um, which I'll talk a little about that too. Um, but yeah, this is just kind of the general overview of, of the river, of the river itself. Um, oops. So going to go over a little brief history of um, land use on the Eno and then also the formation of the Eno River Association. So <clears throat> if you're not aware, uh, the Eno is named after a group of indigenous people who were the original stewards of the land. So the Eno and the Shikori Native Americans are thought to have inhabited um, towns along the river uh, in and near present day Durham County. Uh, these two groups kind of disappear from the historical record around 1715. It's thought that they kind of merged with larger tribal groups like the Catawba, who were further down south, and the Saponi, who are further north. Um, and that was just as a result of, as you might imagine, kind of dwindling populations as they encountered more colonists who had come over, more settlers. Um, as well as um, some conflict with rival um, tribal groups and diseases that were brought over from colonists as well. Um, so because their populations were kind of declining, they were forced to like seek um, refuge with other larger groups. The Okanichi um, Native Americans, they actually are originally from the, in Virginia and the Roanoke River near present day Clarksville, Virginia, um, but they, they came migrated down south along the Eno River near present-day Hillsborough, um, and that was in the 1600s. Um, they migrated back and forth for a while and kind of landed in Orange County, present-day Orange County, in the early 1800s. And today, the Okanichi Band of the Saponi Nation is a nonprofit and a state-recognized tribal group, um, a state-recognized state tribe, um, which is made up of descendants of many of the tribal groups from the area. So um, various groups that have been in the area, Sisipaha, um, Okanichi, uh, Shikori, Eno, um, and just other other groups of, of Siouan descent, um, kind of their descendants make up the Okanichi band of the Saponi Nation. Uh, you can see the emblem down here, their emblem. And then this is a photo of the Okanichi replica village. If you haven't visited that, I encourage you to. It's open to the public and it's, um, it is uh, on the river walk in Hillsborough. And um, it's situated very close to, it's not on the actual site where um, a, an Okanichi village was found, but there is nearby um, was kind of excavated um, an Okanichi village. Um, so <clears throat> colonists began settling in the area in the late 1600s. They set up farms, they set up homesteads. 
Um, and then in the late 1700s and 1800s, mills became a really big part of life for settlers in the area. So along the Eno's 40-ish miles, there were about 32 mills that were established. Um, and most of these were saw or grist mills. Uh, so that means they were converting log into lumber or they were converting grains into uh, cornmeal and flour and usable products. And of course, they were using the power of the river um, to do that. So these mills, they were industrial, commercial, and social centers, and they became big parts of not only the local economy, but also the social structure of the communities in the area. Um, <clears throat> lots of other like uh, like blacksmith shops and general stores would be set up around mills, and um, they would just be really kind of bustling community centers um, during the 1700s, early 1800s. Um, I think it's important to say that during this time, Enslaved people were a huge part of why farms and mills were so very successful and lucrative, which they were very successful during this time. Um, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of documentation um, of enslaved individuals and families and, um, you know, and the role, not only the role that they played in, in the success of these mills, but also just um, the lives that they carved out for themselves. Um, there is continuing research being done to learn more about um, enslaved and formerly enslaved individuals who who lived along the Eno River. So, for example, um, Durham Parks and Recreation does a um, tour on Saturdays um, at West Point Mill, and they talk about the life of William Dink McCown, who was a formerly enslaved man who worked was who worked at um, West Point Mill and then continued to work as a miller after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed. Um, so as industrialization kind of changed the face of mill culture in the late 1800s, mills began closing. Um, and then in 1908, a big flood came and it wiped out many of the remaining mills, which led to a sharp decline in mill culture. Uh, Durham and surrounding areas uh, continued to industrialize and grow. And in the 1960s, there we go. The 1960s, the city of Durham began purchasing land along the Eno with the intent of building a dam to serve as a new drinking reservoir for the people of Durham and for its growing population. Uh, as you might be aware, dams can be really ecologically devastating. So they can cut off important migration routes for fish and other species. Um, they can really alter like nutrient cycles. They can just totally change the flow of a river, um, cause flooding, all sorts of things. So a group of concerned citizens led by Margaret Nygaard, who you can see in the bottom left here, um, <clears throat> they came together to voice their concerns with this proposed dam. So this group, they worked tirelessly. They, uh, they researched history of the river. They conducted wildlife inventories. They created river maps. They contacted local officials. They led hikes that ended up bringing out hundreds of people. Um, they did whatever that they could to kind of get the word out um, and voice their opposition, and ultimately they were successful. So alongside the Nature Conservancy, they went to the state and they made their case for creating a state park. Um, and in May of 1972, this idea was approved. Uh, and in 1975, Eno River State Park opened to the public with about a thousand acres at that time. And we'll talk about what it's grown to uh, now. So today, um, this was supposed to, <laughs> this is a slide, I'll come back to this slide in just a sec. So today the Eno River Association is a nonprofit and a land trust with a mission to protect the natural, cultural and historical resources of the Eno River Basin. So um, although we helped create the state park, park back uh, 50 plus years ago, um, we are a separate entity from the state park um, but we do continue to work very closely with them. So as a land trust, we are, um, a big part of what we do is land acquisition or land conservation. Um, so we're able to buy land um, that's within the state parks master plan as it becomes available um, and is on the market. We are able to buy it. Um, we move as a nonprofit, we move a lot faster than um, the state park can with all of the um, kind of red tape and bureaucracy involved in a government agency. Um, so we will acquire that land and then help add it to the state park. 
Um, so I mentioned before that it opened with a thousand acres back in 1975, and today it's at about 4,600 4, acres and it's continuing to grow. So I believe the state park master plan um, has, it, it's like 6,500 acres within the state park master plan. So um, we're continuing to work toward that. Um, and a big part of that, you know, it's not only it's not only protecting land um, for kind of some of the reasons that I'm going to talk about tonight, but uh, but it's also making it accessible, making it opening it to the public and making sure that members of the community have access to it and are able to uh, go out and enjoy it. <clears throat> so we have also helped other groups with land acquisition projects, and then um, we hold various conservation easements on private lands. And then we have two of our own properties that I mentioned before, which is the Confluence Natural Area and Panther Branch Natural Area, which was this photo. Uh, this is just a photo of kind of the overlook at Panther Branch Natural Area, which is our newest preserve. Um, it's about 56 acres, I believe, and has about two miles of hiking trails uh, and out in Eflind, and it's really beautiful. Um, and then, yeah, this is out of the confluence at one of my programs or we had a, a young kiddo who just really loved being in the water and brought his own waders, um, which is awesome. But uh, the other ways that we kind of, in addition to land conservation effort, land acquisitions, we also, you know, advance our mission through land stewardship, taking care of the land, um, education and outreach, that's the world that I live in, um, which is, you know, we do school programs and summer camps and public programs, private programs and all sorts of stuff. Also advocacy, um, which is just um, when there are potential like developments or projects that could impact negatively impact the Ena River, we work with community members, um, you know, volunteers, other organizations to try to like change the outcome of those, of those uh, proposed projects. And then we have our festival for the Eno, which is our annual 4th of July event. Uh, it, we consider it like our biggest education event. Um, we, it's a waste-free festival, um, which is really cool. And we um, have four music stages, lots of food um, and lots of art. And we spend a lot of time in the river and just teach people about, about the river, which is really cool. <clears throat> okay, so. Let's get into uh, how the Eno River supports wildlife. Um, so as you might be aware, freshwater systems like the Eno make up less than 3% of the Earth's surface, but they uh, are responsible, like they have a um, supported disproportionately large amount of biodiversity. Like they're really small part of the planet um, that support just tons and tons of, of flora and fauna, plants and animals, um, just really biodiverse and productive places. So knowing this, uh, the desire to support um, our native flora and fauna was one of the many reasons behind the formation of the Eno River Association and Eno River State Park. They knew then, and we know now, that um, protecting forested land around the Eno is crucial when it comes to not only protecting that critical habitat for forest dwelling species, but it's also crucial for protecting water quality for the animals that live in and use the water for their life cycles, for their survival. So because of many people's efforts over many years, um, still today the Eno has been found to generally have good or excellent water quality depending on, um, depending on the area exact location that you're at. Um, it, it does have good water quality compared to a lot of other um, rivers and streams, particularly within the Noose River Basin um, and then the Triangle area. So it supports a very robust um, group of, 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 um, of fauna, of wildlife. I won't read off these numbers, but um, just lots of different species um, that it supports. So <clears throat> I figured it would be good to start with some of the species that you're almost certain to see, depending on the time of year, almost certain to see when you go out on the Eno um, and depending on kind of where you're looking, I guess. Uh, but yeah, just want to talk about some of those really common species and mention some cool things about them. Um, so first, I have to mention the great blue heron. Um, so this is one of my favorite 
species. I'm big into birds and um, this is a pretty cool one, very dinosaur-like. So this is a large wading bird. It's at the top of, of you know, food chains. Um, you know, as adults, doesn't really have natural predators. Uh, of course, the young and the eggs can have predators. Um, but you'll often spot uh, these birds wading in the river, kind of either kind of just perched on a rock, perched on the side or fishing, like walking through the river and you can tell that it's it's looking for stuff to eat. Um, so they feed primarily on fish, but also will eat amphibians, reptiles, invertebrates, small mammals, small birds, kind of anything that they can get their mouth around. Um, and they grab their prey and they're really strong mandibles, um, <clears throat> excuse me, or they'll actually sometimes use their really sharp bill to impale like larger prey, larger fish. Um, they'll often shake them to like relax or break their spine and then they'll swallow them whole. So pretty brutal stuff. Um, but great blue herons nest mostly um, just amongst themselves. They'll like form nesting colonies. Sometimes they'll nest with great egrets and they nest in trees and they always do this over standing water. And that's to deter mammal predators like foxes, raccoons from coming at their, their eggs. And a group nest nesting, um, is, it's called a rookery. So you might be familiar with the Durham heron rookery. Um, eat, uh, every spring, minutes from downtown Durham, a large colony of great blue herons and great eagers, they build these big nests high above Ellerby Creek. Um, and just for context, Ellerby Creek flows into Falls Lake uh, about a mile south of the Eno. So um, close by the Eno, they don't really connect, but. Um, and this heron rookery is actually one of the few known nesting sites of great egrets in the entire Piedmont of North Carolina, which is pretty cool. So um, we don't have any rookeries at the Eno uh, but that I know of, but um, pretty cool that there's one close by in Durham. Uh, so next is the Northern water snake. Um, this, this snake is seen very frequently, you know, pretty frequently in the, uh, warmer, hotter months of the year. Uh, they can get pretty big, up to about four and a half feet in length. Um, they're commonly confused with cotton mouths. We don't really have cotton mouths on the Eno, um, but they will also sometimes be confused with copperheads, which we do have. Um, I saw a few out on the Eno last weekend. Or, yeah, last weekend, I think. Um, but I'll show you in the next slide kind of a comparison between copperheads and northern water snakes. They're pretty easy to tell apart. You just have to look up pictures of them, you know what they look like. Um, but northern water snakes feed mostly on fish and amphibians. Um, they are somewhat aggressive. So they are more likely to bite you than a lot of other snakes. Like a lot of other snakes, their first, their first um, instinct is really going to be to escape. And that's the case with these two, but they are more likely to resort to hiding. But they are non-venomous, um, which is obviously good. Um, I worked with northern abandoned water snakes in undergrad and got bit all the time. <laughs> um, so let's see, this next slide <clears throat> shows a northern water snake and a uh, copperhead. So the patterning is the big thing um, to tell them apart. Copperheads always look like this. No matter what age they're at, they're going to look like this. Um, sometimes when they're younger, they have like greenish, yellowish tails. Um, but they always have this tan colored background. And then they have these brown, darker brown blotches. And from above, the blotches look like hourglasses. From the side, the blotches look like Hershey's Kisses. Um, <clears throat> whereas the uh, northern water snake just has like kind of a, I'm not, it's just, it's just a kind of basic banding pattern. It starts out as whole bands um, and then it breaks up as it moves down its body. Um, so that's the northern water snake. Um, other ways that you could pretend, like they're not good ways to tell them apart, but there's still differences is that uh, copperheads have these vertical pupils as with um, a lot of other like viper species. And they have these pits on their face um, that the northern that water snakes don't have because they're pit vipers. Uh, and then um, they also have more triangular shaped heads. But as you can see, even in this picture, sometimes the water snakes are able to like flatten their heads to make them look triangular. So just another reason why that's not a great way 
to tell them apart. And then the last thing I'll mention is that um, copperheads tend to swim on top of the water while water snakes swim more submerged in water. But copperheads aren't super, they're not big into swimming. They can swim, they're not great swimmers. Um, but if you were to see one in the water. Okay. Um, so next is a uh, river cooter and yellow bellied slider. I grouped these together because they're really, really hard to tell apart. Um, so these are probably the two most commonly seen turtle species. Although a Duke herpetologist told me that the actual most common Eno River turtle species is the musk turtle. You just don't see them very often because they hang out on the bottom of the river um, and they really blend in. They look like rocks on the bottom of the river. But these are seen all the time because they're basking turtles, they're out on logs, they're um, on rocks basking when it's warm. So like I mentioned, they can be really difficult to tell apart, um, especially from far away. Once you get up close, you should be able to tell them apart based on their facial markings. So the slider, the yellow-bellied slider has a big yellow blotch behind its eye right here. Whereas the cooter just has a uh, like distinct lines on its face. Other ways to tell them apart, um, the slider has like a more dome-shaped carapace um, and it has more like saw-toothed carapace edges. And the carapace, if you're not familiar, is just the, is just the top half, is the shell. Um, it's the carapace on top and then the plat shock is the part of the shell that's underneath. Um, so yeah, you will definitely see the species out and about when it's warm. Um, but in the winter, pretty interesting, they actually can spend up to like two months, I think it is, under water. They just like stay very, very still on the bottom of the river. Um, and one of the ways that they're able to do this is through specialized tissue in their cloaca, around their cloaca, which is why sometimes people call them butt breathers, <laughs> is because they're actually able to breathe through exchange oxygen with the water through those tissues um, on their cloaca. Um, did want to, I do want to mention the red-eared slider. So this is another species that you can see out on the Eno, but it is invasive. So it's native to the Midwestern United States, from the Midwestern United States to Northern Mexico. Um, but due to, it's, it's extremely prominent in the pet trade. It's like, I think the most, the most traded, heavily traded reptile in the world. Um, and then people release them when they don't want them anymore. When they realize they don't, they don't want a turtle, they just release them. Um, and they've become really established in a lot of other places. So they have become established along Eno, I think most places around here. And they are considered invasive because they outcompete native species. So the yellow-bellied cider is a native species. Well, this species is going to outcompete it um, for resources, for food, um, for shelter, for all sorts of things. So. Um, another thing is that they will actually breed, interbreed with yellow-bellied sliders. So that kind of drowns out, you know, the yellow-bellied sliders genetics, genetic pool. Um, oh, <laughs> and then I just included this photo because it's the cutest turtle. And I caught, this is me, I caught this uh, little tiny musk turtle um, out at, when, around Fuse Ford. I actually caught a couple of them and I just had to include it because they're so very cute. So very cute. <clears throat> Sorry. Okay, so beavers. Um, I think everyone's pretty familiar with beavers. So although you might not see beavers very often, they're definitely present along the Eno and you will see evidence of beavers um, in a lot of cases. So you might see a dam that they've built. You might see a beaver chew. Um, which is just basically like um, a, a tree, a small tree that's been like, you can kind of tell that it's been like chewed off, um, which is what beavers do to build their dams. So obviously beavers are known for building dams and they do this in order to create a reservoir behind the dam that they will then build their lodges in. And they build these dams by cutting down small trees uh, using their very strong teeth. So the reason that their teeth are orange is because they have a lot of iron in them, which makes them very strong. Um, and the rodents, so their teeth grow continuously and they have to, sh you know, chew on things to shave them down. So they'll 
you know, chew on the wood and then they'll also actually eat wood. They will literally eat wood and they also eat, they're totally herbivorous. They'll eat um, leaves, shoots, stems, all that sort of stuff. So beavers are considered ecosystem engineers and also keystone species. So <clears throat> with the ecosystem engineer aspect, they are capable of totally restructuring an ecosystem through their dam building. They basically create these wetland habitats that are then used by tons and tons of other species, which is what makes them a keystone species. So basically other species rely on them in order to have habitat basically. So, um, you know, wetlands, unfortunately, up until really the 1970s were basically just, they were considered, you know, um, a problem for development and infrastructure. And they were seen as like disease breeding swamps and they were drained. A lot of them were drained and we lost a ton of wetlands. And then in the 1970s, we really realized like just how valuable they are for various, for flood management, for all sorts of things. Um, and beavers are really kind of capable of creating those wetland habitats. So beavers were uh, almost extirpated, or extirpated in North America because people wanted their fur and their castoreum, the scent that they produce. Um, <clears throat> but with protection in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, um, the current be beaver population in North America has rebounded to like 10 to 15 million, which is still just a fraction of the original one, like up to 200 million beavers that were in North America. These are some other very common species, um, some that you will see more readily than others, but uh, white-tailed deer, of course, um, <clears throat> uh, eastern box turtles, rat snakes, American toads, red-bellied woodpeckers, red-breast sunfish. These are all species that are pretty prolific uh, throughout the park and just along the Eno, not just the park, but along the Eno. All right, so I'm going to talk about a few less common, uh, sort of more, more elusive species of the Eno versus the river otter. So yes, we do have river otters on the Eno. That might be surprising to some people. They're not seen frequently by any means, but they have definitely been spotted. So there was a recent sighting, sort of recent, I guess it was probably about six months ago, there was a sighting at Panther Branch, um, the natural area that I mentioned, which makes sense. Otters are mostly nocturnal, um, <clears throat> but they will come out during the day in like undisturbed areas and Panther Branch is not really heavily trafficked. It, you know, was private property for a long time. So um, it makes sense that that would be a place that they would kind of come out during the day. Um, but river otters, they can live in a variety of marine and freshwater habitats. They feed mostly on fish and crayfish. Uh, they'll also eat like amphibians and other things. Um, they're, and similarly to beavers, um, they were once very widely distributed. They were one of the most widely distributed mammals in the U.S., um, but populations declined drastically from trapping, um, beginning in the 1500s, but really in, um, uh, there was a lot of over trapping in the 1900s that really depleted their populations and to restore them, the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission released um, about 50 otters in the western part of the state. They were really, um, they they basically disappeared from the western part of North Carolina. So they were re-released out there uh, between 1990 and 1995, and they're now considered abundant throughout the state again. So once again, mostly nocturnal, pretty like secretive and elusive, but definitely present. <laughs> So the yellow-billed cuckoo, I had to include this one because I saw one the other day and I just thought it was so cool. Um, so this bird, uh, so this is a, sl it's a slender, long-tailed bird in the cuckoo family. Um, they stay very well hidden. They have a pretty prominent call. I couldn't get an audio file to attach to this, but you can go look it up. Um, and they, they're pretty just like loud and distinctive. <clears throat> so we are in the breeding range for this species um, in North Carolina. So they're most likely to be seen in the summer months. So they are long distance migrants. They migrate to South America for the winter. Um, and then the East Coast birds travel via Central America and the West Indies. Um, and they come here for the summer. Uh, and they use wooded habitat with dense cover and water nearby is what they um, 
their kind of preferred habitat. So the con uh, the confluence is where I saw one. Um, so it makes sense once again because the confluence, you know, has pretty significant wooded area and there's water nearby. Pretty good habitat for a yellow-billed cuckoo. Um, <clears throat> so yellow-billed cuckoos, they're insect eaters. They primarily eat caterpillars. So an individual cuckoo can eat thousands of caterpillars per season. They'll also eat frogs, they'll eat lizards, they'll eat other things. They eat uh, fruit, berries, and seeds in the winter. Um, but they are among the few bird species that are able to eat, eat hairy caterpillars. And in the east, they eat really large numbers of tent caterpillars, which are considered pets. So they'll eat as many as like 100 in a single sitting, which is pretty cool. All right, so uh, last of the less common species is the long nose gar. Once again, not a fish that you're necessarily likely to see when you're in the Eno, but they're definitely present. Um, I haven't seen one myself, but I know people who have, who've gotten pictures of them. Um, so this is a fish with like, uh, with a kind of torpedo shaped body. Um, and they have what are called ganoid scales. So these scales are found in sturgeons, gars. You can see in this little chart down here, the ganoid. Um, they're found in sturgeon gars, bowfins, paddlefish, um, and they're made of bone, actually, which is different from the more common cycloid and tenoid scales of other fish. Uh, they have, obviously, these really elongated jaws that are, like, more than three times the, the length of their head with really sharp, uh, like, small, sharp, cone-shaped teeth. Um, <clears throat> they're sometimes referred to as, like, primitive fish because they kind of look primitive and they do have some primitive features like their um the way that their intestines are are primitive <clears throat> but they're not primitive in the sense of of not being fully developed um and they typically inhabit freshwater lakes uh like um, swampy areas and then like slow moving sluggish backwaters of rivers and streams and they can actually breathe both air and water which allows them to live in aquatic environments with really low oxygen levels which is pretty cool. Here's some more species that are definitely present along the Eno. Not super likely to see them, some more than others. So belted kingfishers, you can see, if, if you know how to look for them, you can see them pretty readily. I, I see one over the, or I see a few belted kingfishers over the, uh, the little river like every day, just sitting on a line, kind of looking down. They're, they're really cool. Um, Cool species, but bobcats definitely present in the triangle, present throughout the state. Um, barred owls are the most common owl species. Eastern red spotted newts, this is one in its adult adult phase. It, newts are interesting because they start out aquatic, then they are terrestrial for a few years, and then they go back to being fully aquatic. Um, <clears throat> there's a, there's a, a place called Bacon Quarry not technically within the Eno, but it's close to the Eno. It's in the state park that uh, has a lot of adult um, newts. And then minks, minks are present as well as, this is a musk turtle that I mentioned before. So that look like, they're actually really not, they spend all their time in the water. They're not great swimmers. They just walk along the bottom of the river. All right. So now we're going to get into some of the rare, some of the endangered, threatened species of the Eno. Scientists have identified about uh, at least 14 rare animal species living in and along the Eno. Several of these are mussels, are freshwater mussels, so like the dwarf, the dwarf wedge mussel, the eastern lamp mussel, um, also some snails um, that are present. I, we have one snail species that's like only found in the Eno, which is pretty cool. I'm not going to get super into the details of different mussels, uh, mussel species, but I will say that mussels are incredibly important for freshwater ecosystems. They play such an important role in filtering and cleaning the water, acting as food sources, you know, being important in the food food chain. So um, really important that we, you know, protect the Eno in order to protect mussels among other species. So this is my favorite species to talk about. It's the Noosa River Water Dog. Really cool, really cool species, sometimes called a Carolina mud puppy. Um, this is an aquatic salamander species that is endemic to or only found in the Noose and Tarpimlico River basins. 
So it's only found in North Carolina. Um, it tends to be found in um, rivers and larger streams. They they really need to have, uh, they prefer to have like leaf beds that they can burrow down in the summer. We'll talk a little more about that. <clears throat> but a little bit about their life history. So um, New River water dogs are, are patom, what's called patomorphic. So they, um, it means that they retain their juvenile characteristics throughout their entire life. So what I mean by that is their gills, their flattened tail. Those are things that a lot of other salamanders lose as they, when they um, grow out of their larval stage, they lose those things uh, and then they go on land. This species doesn't do that. It stays aquatic its entire life and retains those characteristics that it's born with. Um, they are ambush predators, so they'll kind of hang out under rocks and different things, debris, and then they'll ambush their prey. They're fully carnivorous. They eat invertebrates. They eat some small vertebrates, just any anything they can fit in their mouth. <clears throat> so because of this species limited range, very limited range, um, and because of its sensitivity to pollution, uh, and sensitivity to habitat alteration. It's super, super sensitive to these things. Its populations have seen huge declines in recent years. Um, particularly, this is particularly true for populations in the Noose River Basin near the Triangle. So biggest threat to this species is habitat degradation. Um, so, you know, um, deforestation, development, things that affect water quality, ultimately affect water quality and affect their habitat quality, um, affect habitat, habitat connectivity, things like that. Um, but I will mention that this species is also, and, and also I'm sure that everyone knows this, but like, you know, amphibians, they breathe through their skin, right? So like, or their skin is, I, they have gills that help, but they also take in a lot of stuff through their skin, right? So pollution will just be absorbed into their skin, which can be really problematic for all kinds of amphibian species. Um, but also this species is cold adapted. Uh, so it's only really active at temperatures below about 50, 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, <clears throat> so climate change is another, another sort of thing to consider when we're thinking about like the threats to this species is like as temperatures warm as water temperatures warm, that's going to be a really big, a really big problem for this species in addition to the other things, the other threats that it's facing. So it was listed as a species of special concern by North Carolina in 1990. And then um, it was federally listed as threatened officially in June of 2021. So it has received um, additional protections and there's a plan moving forward to hopefully prevent the species from ultimately going extinct. Um, you know, of course it's it's still a big concern. Um, I got to go out with North Carolina State uh, University researchers. Um, so Eric Teetsworth is kind of the, the master of New River water dogs. Um, he has been studying them for years now and writing his dissertation on, on their populations and all sorts of things related to this species. Um, so I was lucky enough to get to go out with them. We surveyed five sites in the Eno River and we didn't catch any, um, but we caught one in the, in the Little River, which was really exciting. So um, as you can see, they can get pretty big. They can get it like almost a foot long. Um, just really, really cool species. Um, now just, we didn't find them in the, you know, this day that we went, but they have, they've found, they've caught about five Neese River water dogs in the, you know, in the past few years. So not great. They, ca they catch way more in other locations. So they are still present in the, you know, that's like, they definitely are. It's just their populations are not doing well. And that's just as a result of, um, you know, increased uh, development and like decreased habitat quality for them as a result of um, not having those protected landscapes around them. <clears throat> All right, next up, Carolina Mad Tom. I think, yeah, Carolina Mad Tom. So this is a small catfish species. It is endemic to, once again, only found in the Noose and Tarpon Lake River basins. Um, one cool thing about the species is that they have venomous ducts 
inside the large spines of their pectoral fins and they can sting with those. It's kind of, it can be compared to like a bee sting, like a honeybee sting, apparent, apparently. I have not felt what it feels like. Um, so they live in medium to large streams with moderate flow. Uh, adult, like both adults and young are nocturnal. They are benthic insectivores that spend time on the bottom of the river. They feed on mostly immature aquatic insects. Um, nesting occurs within or under cover objects. So one of our actually, one of our summer camp teachers helps to create these little, I think she worked, went out with a research team and she helps to create these little, um, these little like nesting structures, cover objects that you can actually put in um, places where it's known that Carolina mad tops are present. Of course, researchers are doing this who know what they're doing, but um, that's just to improve the habitat quality and give them those places where they can nest because it's part of their life cycle, it's part of their behavior and their ecology. So their historical range included all major and many of the minor tributaries to the Newson Tarpon Licorice River basins. Now biologists with the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission have surveyed for Carolina mad toms in the 60s, the 80s, and then again in 2007. In the 60s, populations looked great, they were healthy. By the 80s, they were noticing steady declines. And then in 2007, the commission found this species at only 10% of the areas where the fish historically occurred within the Noose River Basin. Um, only two populations were found. Now they fared much better, once again, in the Tar River. Um, so doing much better there. And that difference is, you know, due to the fact that there's just been a lot more urban development um, in and around the Noose River uh, with deforestation and growth and um, all of these near streams that's led to degraded habitat led to degraded water quality. Um, in the Tar River Basin, there's kind of more rural communities, farmlands, and forests. So it's really just the way the land around these rivers has been used. So in 2007, it was listed as threatened and a federal species of concern. In June of 2021, along with the Hughes River Water Dog, um, it was the Carolina Mad Tom was listed at the same time, um, but the water dog was listed as threatened, mad tom was listed as endangered. So it is under the Endangered Species Act by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, now the Fish and Wildlife Service, I, spoiler alert, the mad tom has not been found in the Eno in many years, um, but the Eno is listed by the Fish and Wildlife Service as critical habitat um, that's essential to the conservation of the species. So there is potential for things like reintroductions, um, these things do happen and they do work sometimes. It depends on a lot of factors, but um, but I think it's still important to mention that the Eno is still considered like a management unit is what it's called um, for the for the Carolina Mad Tom and still considered important for its conservation. Um, the flathead catfish, this is just another kind of um, note about an invasive species. This, this is an invasive uh, catfish uh, that is a top predator in the Noose and Tar River basins. Um, it's not, it doesn't really have natural predators. Um, big, it's big fish and it feeds mostly on other fish. So this is another threat for Carolina mad toms. Um, hydrilla is another problem for mad toms because um, if you're familiar with hydrilla, it's like an aquatic invasive species that came over with like the aquarium trade back a while back. Uh, and just has become a huge problem, unfortunately. And a lot of our freshwater systems, they form these really dense mats on the surface of the water and they don't let light through. Um, they contribute to sediment buildup, things like that. All right, and lastly, we have the tricolored bat. So I just wanted to mention this one. Uh, I wanted to mention like a, a forest, you know, species that kind of more inhabits the forests. Uh, but this is a bat that's native to Eastern, North America, um, its common name is, comes from the hairs on its back, which have three distinct color bands. Um, <clears throat> this bat is an insectivore, an insectivore. It preys on a variety, a wide array of different insects. Um, and it was once considered one of the most common bat species in its range. Uh, in North Carolina, tricolor bats are found throughout the state, but their populations really seem to be declining, particularly in the mountain 
in the mountains. Um, and that's where, because of white nose syndrome, um, which is greatly affecting the species. If you're not familiar with white nose syndrome, it's a disease that's caused by um, a fungus that affects hibernating bats. So this fungus, it grows in these cold, damp, like caves often, and then it attacks the, the skin, the bare skin of the bats while they're inactive, they're hibernating, they're inactive, and then it grows on them and it causes changes in them. So basically it causes them to become more active and it causes them to burn up fat that they need to survive the winter. And then because of that, they like, they will just have really strange behaviors. They'll fly out of the cave, you know, in the middle of the day, which is not it, their normal behavior. They'll fly out, and, you know, they'll fly out of the cave in the dead of winter. And unfortunately, like a lot of them will end up starving or freezing because they're just not doing what they're supposed to be doing because of this fungus. Um, so this species is still thought to be fairly common in the Piedmont, for the, but it's just not totally clear how their populations are doing. Um, in 2022, it was petitioned for inclusion on the U.S. endangered species list, and the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission followed with a state endangered status. So, you know, because their populations are really declining in some areas, and because uh, this species, it relies on mature old growth forests, um, with closed canopies that they can use for roosting and foraging. So it's really important to protect certain areas like Okanichi Mountain State Natural Area, which is an old growth forest, um, in order to really uh, provide habitat for this species that is otherwise like really suffering population de declines in other areas. Um, they are found in Eno River State Park in the summer. Um, they have been in the past where they uh, roost in trees. So this is just another species to consider when we're thinking about kind of the importance of protecting the forests around the Eno. So um, in general, the Eno and the forests around the Eno are really important in the preservation, for the preservation of critical habitat and the conservation of many, many different wildlife species. Um, so along with community members, volunteers, partners, and so on, our organization works really hard um, to ensure that this natural resource is protected um, and that it will be protected for generations to come. <clears throat> of course, um, just learning about and talking about, you know, the Eno River, talking about our freshwater resources, uh, talking about the work that land trusts do, all of that is, is really helpful in itself. Um, but when it comes to you know advancing our mission, but if you're interested in getting more involved, um, please feel free to go to our website and you can find information about our stewardship work days. You can find information about becoming part of um, becoming an education volunteer, um, like assisting with advocacy work, or of course being one of the hundreds of volunteers that we rely on for you know. So thank you guys so much. Uh, I really enjoyed being here. And if you have questions, please, I'm happy to answer them. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Audrey. That was a great presentation. We do have one question that just popped in the chat. So uh, this question is from Courtney. They ask, what's the biggest water quality issue the aquatic animals of the Eno face? Is it nutrient, oh, sorry, is it nutrient pollution, sedimentation, or other things? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's hard to just like pick one and be like, oh yeah, this is the, the biggest threat. I will say that based on reports about the water quality in the Eno, two of the things um, that have been flagged as you know, potentially problematic are uh, basically sedimentation. So like turbidity levels, increased turbidity levels where the water is really cloudy and can cause all sorts of problems. So I would say definitely sedimentation, like erosion um, along the river can be a big problem. And then also actually bacteria levels. So that can occur um, from basically waste. Um, I'm not a hundred percent sure like what, like what specifically the bacteria was, but like um, when sewer, sewage systems don't work properly, sometimes sewage can spill into rivers, um, also like pet waste, animal waste, things like that. So there have been heightened turbidity and um, 
and um, yeah, bacteria, bad bacteria levels that are problematic for those animals. And then I would just say in general, like uh, definitely development, like imper when impervious surfaces are, are put in and um, all, like pollution from various, you know, um, various sources is running into the river. That's just, that's generally what I would say is like the big, the biggest threat probably among other things. Well, I have a question. Um, okay. Also, along the lines of pollution, um, I know that you were mentioning how a lot of the species, especially amphibians, are very sensitive to the different changes in the waters. So, um, what are some things that we could do, possibly at home, to help um, continue the sentiment of water quality for the Eno and other watersheds alike? Yeah, I think um, at home, honestly, just just practicing any of the like um, the normal things that you hear about, right? Like practicing smart consumerism that isn't contributing to um, things that are putting out pollution into the environment, but also things like if you have, um, you know, if you're if if you're using if you have gardens, if you're using pesticides, if you're using herbicides, if you're using any sort of chemicals, anything like that, um, being really intentional about your use with that and making sure that you're using things um, appropriately and not like adding uh, to um, to that issue. And then also like putting in a, I mean, there's so many like putting in like a um, a uh, a rain a rain garden. That sounds so. That's all right. Like putting in a garden that absorbs rainfall. Uh, putting in a barrel that absorbs rainfall, so that you're having like more water that's being filtered through the ground and less water that's running off into our rivers and streams, right? Um, and and the more like rewilding, I think I love, I mean, it's difficult to do. I'm in the process of doing it in my yard, but like just really making your home, if possible, when possible, sometimes it's not, and that's totally fine. But like, if you can plant native species that support diversity and also act to filter um, ground, like water before it goes into the ground, which is ultimately gonna end up in the river, I think that's a really like powerful and meaningful thing that you can do is like, um, is, yeah, planting native species, like being a smart consumer, um, using chemical, any sort of chemicals appropriately, things like that. Awesome. I don't see any more questions. I did have one other question. Uh-huh. This slipped my mind. Oh, you're fine. <laughs> um, well, I want to thank you, Audrey, for giving such an awesome presentation. And thank you to everyone who tuned in and joined us for tonight. Um, again, this presentation has been recorded, and it will be sent to you all via email once it's been edited. And I hope that you share it to your friends and your family so that they can also learn about the Eno River. And if you enjoyed this webinar, we will be back again tomorrow night with the South Lake Conservationists with the webinar on backyard nature. So thank you, everyone. And I hope everybody has a good rest of their evening. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Shauna.